You've got the BBC absolutely able to do what it pleases on a multi-billion pound budget. Vanessa, welcome to UK Column News. And uh, you're going to take us through BBC fake news before getting into some of the horrors that, of course, that the BBC just doesn't or will not report. Um, yes, I mean, you know, the BBC is infamous for, um, particularly as you've mentioned many times before, it's BBC Media Action, basically an infiltration tool into countries like Syria um, that after the scouting done by BBC Media Action would then be um, basically targeted for regime change and destabilization. Um, we've covered this a number of times. But this is actually on the BBC World News website. Uh, the report was generated by BBC Persia, which is known by most Iranians to be, let's say, the flagship of the propaganda that is being waged against Iran. And of course, one of the mainstays of that propaganda is uh, the um, head covering rule. They always call it a hijab. You don't have to wear a hijab in Iran. Um, I spent two weeks there um, about two years ago um, in Tehran and in a number of other cities and the headscarf rule is simply that, just cover your head. You don't have to wear a veil, you don't have to wear even um, a, a full uh, hijab of, of any description. And I have to say that I didn't see any morality police and the majority of women in Tehran in particular uh, in many of let's say the wealthier areas but also in the markets and the souks were not wearing any kind of head covering but the BBC has put out this quite incredible um, headline for me Iranian woman paralyzed after being shot over hijab over hijab I should have in underlined this and then let's have a look at the actual report so this was reported by Baham Gobadi, who is actually based in the UK, when you look at his ex account, formerly with Reuters, now with BBC Persian. So a mother of two has been left paraplegic, according to the BBC, after being shot by Iranian police over an alleged violation of the country's strict hijab rules. A source with knowledge of the case has told the BBC how many times have we seen BBC and legacy media reports using these anonymous sources to basically back up the mainstay propaganda against a target nation. And of course, this is coming in at a time that Iran is, if you like, center stage with the potential of escalation between Israel and Iran um, after the assassination of the Hamas chief negotiator, Ismail Haniya in Tehran two weeks ago. So let's have a look at what the actual um, police report said, um, unfortunately, I've only got it in um, Persian, um, but basically a number of activists went immediately onto X to say that that's literally not true. She was inside a fully tinted uh, glass windows car and ignored an anti theft halt. So the police believed the car was stolen and then tried to escape. When you actually read the police report itself, they talk about the fact that she ran through red lights. She ran through police stops and bear in mind, they couldn't see who was actually in the car. So when they got to her, she was injured um, in the police report itself. It doesn't actually mention any shooting. So potentially she was injured simply through um, damage to the car or crashing the car. It has literally nothing to do with her hijab. That's the very important point here. And, you know, even if there is some question over this, the BBC is not reflecting that question. The headline is very unambiguous. Um, it, it deliberately gravitates towards this having something to do with, with the uh, head covering, which actually it really doesn't, according to information that I've received. And there's no verification, there's no substantiation. So, you know, this is the rigorous journalism, as I've been told multiple times by the BBC when they question my narratives from inside Syria, um, that the BBC is constantly boasting of, I'll leave people to make up their own minds whether they consider the BBC to be fit for purpose or not. I'll just um, come, come back to you, Vanessa. Of course, I remember mm. very well a couple of years ago, the BBC pumping articles out about the hit, uh, wearing yeah. the hijabs 
um, in Iran, and we tackled the BBC at the time and said that basically their reports were inflammatory mm. and in inaccurate. And of course, eventually the BBC just simply refused to answer. But to us, it was very clear that the agenda of the BBC was to use the hijab as um, a wedge to start unrest in Iranian society. And of course, that mirrors exactly BBC me media action working inside Syria to engage those who were challenging the government. Mm -hmm. So um, it's it's terrible times when uh, um, you have a multi-billion pound uh, media organisation funded by the taxpayer that is then going to effectively tell lies to the people paying for it. Yeah. Through really sad things that have been happening in the Middle East over the last couple of days. Yep. So, you know, focus again on the ongoing almost 10 month uh, genocide in Gaza and the occupied territories by the Zionist forces. So on August the 10th, uh, day 309 of the war, there were actually two attacks uh, on schools which were housing displaced refugees from other areas of Gaza that had fled to these schools for shelter. And of course, they were told these were safe places. But we're going to focus on what has been called the Al-Fajr massacre, which is the dawn prayers uh, for Muslims, which resulted in over 100 people um, killed, being killed. Um, when Israeli forces targeted the at tabayin school in Gaza City during dawn prayers, more than 200 people were injured. The school sheltering thousands of displaced individuals was hit while people were praying, leading to extensive casualties and devastation. And we're just going to show a very short video. Um, it's not particularly distressing, but it will just show the, the, uh, the school itself um, and how tightly packed the school was with civilians and, of course, the majority, again, being women and children when it was targeted um, by Israeli airplanes. Um, now, it has been reported by the Gaza Civil Defense that the Israeli army used three bombs weighing 2,000 pounds each. So these are the MK-84 US supplied bombs that are um, designed to basically destroy armored vehicles. Um, um, and three of these, so that's I think 907 kilos per bomb. Um, designed to basically shatter armored vehicles and tanks was dropped on these thousands of displaced unarmed refugees. You can imagine the absolute devastation. And in fact, the was so great. It was so horrendous. Body, bodies were literally um, torn apart. If we look at the um, next report, um, every 70 kilograms of remains of body parts is considered a martyr. What does this actually mean? Because the rescue teams couldn't identify many of the human remains collected due to the intensity of the bombing, the doctors at the Baptist Hospital were not able to identify each martyr individually. Instead, the doctors have started collecting body parts in plastic bags and giving 70 kilos of remains to the family of a martyr who's gone missing. Just let that sink in for a second. You don't receive the body of your dead child or your dead father, mother, brother, sister. You receive body parts that weigh 70 kilos. And there was a young man from Gaza who went on Twitter to express what this means to the people of Gaza. So on the left, um, I apologize, you do see the bags that are being produced with the body parts. So he actually said, we are no longer numbers, we are approximate numbers, absolutely horrifying. How, does, um, how do the Zionist forces justify um, this kind of heinous massacre? Well, in the Jerusalem uh, Post article, the IDF has um, basically said is that they were targeting um, terrorists that were taking shelter in the school. Um, in this one article, they have named multiple so-called terrorists. 
Um, they named 12 more terrorists killed in Gaza school strike. No answer on the civilians. Well, let's see how, um, how um, truthful those claims are. This was an article in uh, Press TV. Living on lies, Israeli claim of killing Hamas members at the Gaza City School debunked. And then let's have a look at the actual content of the article, which focuses in one part on uh, Rami Abdu, chairman of Euromed Monitor Human Rights Organization that investigates the crimes of the Israeli forces in Gaza, said four of the victims singled out by the Israeli military as Hamas members were from the Jabari family whom he knew personally. They never engaged in any political or military activities. Um, another one was my neighbor from the Habib family who had a serious dispute with Hamas. He noted another civilian, Abdul Saad, was Abdul Karim Hamad, a devout man who sympathized with Hamas but had never joined its ranks. Um, so he basically says the Israeli regime lives on lies. And if you go to his Twitter account or his ex account, you can see a number of names uh, singled out. Uh, demonstrating the lies of the Zionist entity having carried out, uh, you know, one of, again, one of the worst massacres, but we're seeing massacre after massacre. And the following video is actually taken from the Euromed Monitor um, website and X account, and that just shows a section of their investigation into this massacre. Um, and it, it basically goes into great detail um, in the lies that are being produced by uh, the Zionist forces. Um, and there is another uh, actual ex um, post where they produce all the names, particularly of the children that were killed in this attack. Okay, Vanessa, thank you, thank you very much for that report. It is absolutely tragic what it, what is going on. It's horrific and it's tragic what is going on. Um, for me, for Israel to claim that it knows the identities of people in the very buildings is just incredible. You 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 may know some, you may know one or two, but to be able to say we knew exactly who was in that building in the prevailing conditions is just to me, an incredible claim, uh, just incredible. Um, we need to stop it. I think the really sad thing is that we're not seeing any numbers of politicians in the UK or the US or indeed Europe wide who are calling for an end to the violence. What we seem to have is more and more calls for more weapons and munitions to go into Israel. And of course, um, those supplies are led by the, the US and the UK. Um, they need to be stopped. So I'll bring you back in and uh, you're going to be talking to us about escalation effectively in the Middle East. What are you seeing? So, yeah, I mean, we're still seeing um, escalation in the region, albeit it's, it's, you know, we haven't yet had the response from the resistance factions, of course, uh, led by uh, Iran. Um, but we've seen a lot of movement from the United States to, of course, uh, bolster its defenses for its partner uh, in crime in Israel. Um, so Defense uh, Minister Austin orders additional naval assets to the Middle East amid rising tensions. He's ordered additional naval assets, which include the USS Georgia submarine, um, and he's told the USS Abraham Lincoln, which is an aircraft carrier strike group, to get a move on. Basically, if we have a look at the uh, text of the article itself, 
Um, so he, that basically confirms what I've said. The order came following a phone call on Sunday. So Sunday, the day that they bombed the school in Gaza and massacred a uh, hundred uh, civilians and, and injuring terribly 200 others. Um, so a conversation between Austin and the Israeli Minister of Defense, Yorav Gallant. Um, Austin reiterated the US commitment to taking every possible step to defend Israel, not to keep peace in the region, exactly the same situation as in Ukraine. Um, noted the strengthening of US military force posture and capabilities throughout the Middle East in light of hostile regional tensions. Again, I, I have to remark that it's quite incredible the pressure that is being put on Iran to back down and yet absolutely no pressure on Israel. In fact, there is, there is total endorsement of Israel's crimes in carrying out its aggression uh, against uh, Beirut and against Tehran. It's, it's, this is, we're living in extraordinary times. So let's have a look again at uh, the US uh, naval hardware that is already in the region. Again, uh, Brian, you might know better than I, but I haven't, I don't remember seeing such a deployment of US uh, naval battalions and, and of course allied battalions um, for uh, a foreign entity, for a foreign nation. Well, I'll, I'll just say, Vanessa, that yes, it is unusual for two carrier groups to be brought in relatively close proximity to each other. So these are massive forces. And mm. to put a scale to it for um, for our viewers and listeners, one of these aircraft carries virtually carrying more aircraft than the average national air force of many countries. So these are immensely powerful assets. And of course, they've got the group of ships with them to provide air and missile defense to the carrier. Um, but the other thing I'm going to say is the reality is, however, that even these units do not have any defense against the latest Russian hypersonic missiles. So there's a game of Russian roulette, um, yeah. a pun I know, but I've used the expression <laughs> um, underway here because at the end of the day, should uh, Russia decide to use its latest weapons, then even these American carrier groups are vulnerable. Yeah, and let's remember that even Anshrullah, even the Yemeni um, forces, managed to um, actually strike, was at the Theodore Roosevelt. So, I mean, none of them are impervious to the resistance um, missiles, including Iran's developed ballistic and cruise missiles. Um, and even potentially Yemen, Iraq, et cetera. Um, but let's have a look what else the US is providing to what is effectively declared a genocidal entity. So 3.5 billion more in um, immediate military aid to Israel amid the war in Gaza. But also in the last 24 hours, the Amer America has pledged a further 20 billion. I think it's around five arms packages um, to Israel. So again, extraordinary um, funding and sponsorship of this ethno supremacist um, entity. Um, then let's have a look at an opinion piece in Haaretz, which again, it's a, a Israeli based uh, media, Netanyahu wants a world war. So what is the author saying? Let's have a look. Um, he's basically saying so he's talking um, about the fact that in April, Netanyahu had orchestrated a situation where the US was mobilized alongside its World War II allies, France and Britain, together with moderate sunny states, Sunni states, uh, which of course include uh, Jordan and Saudi Arabia and Egypt, et cetera, into a coalition defending Israel. So this was when um, Israel had targeted the Iranian consulate in Damascus this is Netanyahu's dream come true, the world in an uproar with Israel at the epicenter. And I do think that this has this sort of bleeds into many more issues that we're looking at. The results of Hanye's assassination in Tehran are even more impressive as far as Netanyahu is concerned. Biden sent a force to the region that dwarfs the contingent sent in April. Netanyahu is setting the agenda. The world is breaking up around him. His actions are keeping Vladimir Putin too from his slumber. He's more relevant than ever on the global stage. 
and Netanyahu prevents the end of the war in Gaza in order to ignite a world war. In his megalomaniac hallucinations, this world war, the victory of civilization over the barbarians shall be his legacy. And of course, where I would comment here is, is if Netanyahu were to leave tomorrow, actually this agenda would continue. It might take a slightly different shape. It might take a slightly different optic. Um, but, but the dominance of the far right extremism and Netanyahu's type of expansionism uh, and, and uh, revisionist Zionism um, is, is an ideology held by the majority of Israelis. And in fact, if we look at the next video, which is of um, the, the chief of one of the settler unions, I guess you'd call it, uh, Daniela Weiss, who's been uh, operating uh, alongside the various Zionist governments since the 1970s, where she partnered Ariel Sharon to effectively ensure that the settlements stole as much Palestinian territory as possible. We've played um, a video with her in it before, so I've included just a few seconds of the original video we played and a recent TV interview where she talks about the fact that um, the settlers will be in Gaza. In other words, it's going to be a copy paste of what happened in the West Bank will then be carried out uh, in Gaza. This land was promised to the Jews by God. So yeah. Yeah. מכיוון שיש לי איזושהי תחושה של הריתמוס ההיסטורי, ברגע שראש הממשלה נתניהו אמר אה, שתהיה אה, נוכחות צבאית ממושכת, אמרתי זהו, ככה, ככה זו הזמנה למח... למחול. והוא עשה לנו ממש הזמנה למחול. אני נשאר, ואתם תשתמשו בניסיון, אני קוראת לזה העתק הדבק, מה שעשינו ביהודה ושומרון, וגם אבל מה יהיה עם כל הערבים? Um, and we've mentioned the fact that, in fact, Netanyahu is doing nothing to bring back the hostages. We know now that Hamas, under the leadership of Yahya Sinwar, has actually pulled out of the negotiations on Thursday, saying that Netanyahu, instead of agreeing to um, the, uh, the agreement that was set by Biden on the 2nd of July, he's introduced new measures that he knows perfectly well Hamas are going to refuse which means that the ceasefire agreement will be delayed yet again. I mean, this is, you know, this is what has been going on since October the 7th, and that Netanyahu and, and the Zionist forces can continue their ethnic cleansing in the whole of Palestine. Um, the next video, again, I just want to bring in Alistair Crook, former diplomat um, who goes on interview with Judge Napolitano every Monday, and it's well worth watching because I think his analysis of the region uh, is among the best. And here he's talking about why he believes um, war, a regional war, is inevitable. Fair to say Netanyahu does not want a ceasefire and does not want a deal to return the hostages. He wants a wider war against Iran. That's obvious, yeah, quite clear. He's made that absolutely apparent. There's not a single doubt about that in in, uh, amongst Israelis, he wants a full war and right, he wants to provoke it. And that's why the great danger is, as I say, not just what Iran does in whenever it does it in this next period, but might be much more threatening than people expect. I know the, the sort of myth of Israeli military um, greatness is, is, is pervasive, but it may be much more serious than they expect and then they will react. And what will they do to provoke it to the next level where America is fully engaged? Use a tactical nuclear weapon? That's been threatened by Israel, something like that. Well, that will certainly take us to a different level. Where will it leave Russia and China? I mean, this is, this is why I say it seems to me almost inevitable because there's no one actually Pulling back, actually. And then finally, I just want to play a video from uh, 2019 with uh, Sayed Mohammed Morandi, 
uh, a professor in Tehran University. I'm sure everybody knows him. He's a regular guest on the BBC and Channel 4, pushing back against their propaganda. But here he talks about what will happen uh, in the case of a regional escalation, what will happen to um, the Persian Gulf and what will happen to the oil installations there and how that will disastrously impact upon particularly Western economy. And of course, that, that's a repeat of uh, the Ukraine playbook and the Nord Stream uh, sabotage. They cannot win a war in the Persian Gulf. Anyone who looks at the map knows that from the northern tip to the southern tip of the Persian Gulf, Iran has a strong presence. And it is a small gulf or waterway, the Persian Gulf. The oil and gas facilities are impossible to protect. If there is war, the closure of the Strait of Hormoz would be a sideshow. That would be nothing in comparison to the complete and utter destruction of all the oil and gas facilities in the Persian Gulf, as well as all the tankers. Okay, Vanessa, th thank you very much for that section. Many people saying we're moving very quickly towards World War III. Isn't that an incredible statement? But for me, what is really incredible is we are not seeing a clamor of politicians throughout the world to wind back on this violence, both in Ukraine and the Middle East in order to get the world back on a stable, uh, peaceful footing. We seem to have people that want nothing but war. And what is so terribly sad, I think, for the US is that the wealth of America, a great nation, is simply being poured into weapons and munitions on the battlefield with no clear-cut um, idea of what the result is going to be of the use of those weapons. So I think there needs to be massive reflection by the voting public in the West. And certainly our politicians need to be held to account as to what's happening at the moment.